Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. Keeping it free. Blogspot.com. I'm a civil attorney in Northern California. I usually handle litigation matters and divorce cases. You can look me up at avvo.com. A-V-V-O dot com. Let's talk about D.B. Cooper. Now, let me lead by saying, you know, I love hearing about the mythology of crimes. And this, of course, is one of the biggest plane jackings of the 20th century in the United States, right? We want to believe that this guy was a anti-establishment guy, a swashbuckler. Over the years, many people have come forward and have said that their father, their uncle, their aunt, their mysterious friend, confess to them on their deathbed that they were D.B. Cooper. Right? The mythology is thick. The purpose of this video is to make the argument that D.B. Cooper was not American. That many of these myths out there are simply that. I'm sure the people coming forward who believe Granddad was D.B. Cooper firmly believe that their family member was in fact the plane hijacker. But let's just look at a few concepts. I'm not planning on this video, which has already gone about a couple minutes, being too long. But let's just take another look at it. Let me also say too, we have a great community here on YouTube, right? Many of you are very interested in crime and I've learned a lot reading the comment section to the videos here, right? If you have a theory on D.B. Cooper and you have evidence that you want to discuss in the public, I hope you consider leaving those comments in the comment section of this video. Now it's the day before Thanksgiving. That's important, 1971. What does that mean? That means a lot of people are off work, right? There's a distinct possibility that D.B. Cooper had a nine to five. Let's go one step further, right? Since D.B. Cooper is taking a plane from Portland to Seattle, There's a possibility that D.B. Cooper is from the Pacific Northwest, isn't there? Right, so understand, D.B. Cooper is really a fictional name given the hijacker by the press at the airport, at Portland International Airport, as he's boarding a flight to Seattle. He identifies himself as Dan Cooper, right? Understand, the day of the hijacking, there is no one at the airport or on the plane, no one who ever hears him call himself Dan, excuse me, D.B. Cooper, right? On the ticket stuff that he filled out, he lists himself as Dan Cooper, not D.B. Cooper. Let me also add too, because I know people are well-versed on this case. I know there are many letters after the crime takes place to various newspapers across the country where someone calls themselves D.B. Cooper in letters to the media, right? The FBI grabbed a lot of these letters. Some were published, some weren't. Let me just ask you though, because this is different than some other crimes. If you're D.B. Cooper and you've just received $200,000 from hijacking a plane, right? 
why would you ever try to alert the media to where you are? The guy uses a pseudonym, Dan Cooper, right? Why would he draw attention to himself before he has spent the money? Because understand, these letters are sent within days of the plane jacking. Well, let's get back to the plane jacking. Now understand, Dan Cooper is older, right? Many of the three dozen people on the plane, right, the people who would end up being his hostages, viewed him as being in his 40s. This is not a guy who's in his 20s. This is not a guy who's in his 30s, right? He's in his 40s, right? Mid-bill, 170, perhaps a little bit heavier. Understand he's doing things that by today's standards would be viewed as sloppy. He's smoking cigarettes, for example. He calls the stewardess over and he gives the stewardess a note. The note reads, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me. You are B-I-N-G. Right? We'll pretend the word is being hijacked. Now here's a guy who seems to have thought through a lot of things. But yet his note has a misspelling in it. Is this a high IQ guy who's just trying to look ignorant? Or, as I believe, is this a guy whose first language might not be English? Now, I'll agree. The people on the plane, the stewardess, none of them heard him having a detectable accent. None of them. But understand, if you're outside of the Quebec province in Canada, right, there are many parts of Canada where people can speak English without an accent. Let's also back up a little bit. The name Dan Cooper. Would it surprise you to know, and you'll find articles here online, that Dan Cooper was actually a cartoon character? a French language comic book who actually pulled off a plane jacking in which he received the money in a knapsack. Right? This guy who called himself Dan Cooper, who we called D.B. Cooper by accident, this Dan Cooper guy is literally copying a French cartoon character. The comic was sold in Canada. Also, this guy's interesting. Isn't he, especially in the early 70s, isn't he a little bit old, in his 40s, to be reading comic books? That might tell us a little bit about the guy, or perhaps... The guy has a son or daughter who reads Dan Cooper comic books. Let me also say, too, that the guy's demand note when he gets to Seattle Right? And keep in mind, this is an organized hijacker. He asked for four 
for four parachutes. Right? He asked for $200,000. We now know the serial numbers of the currency were recorded. Right? $200,000. A lot of money in 1971. A lot of money now. But the guy also has the presence of mind to ask for food for the crew. Right? Why? Because he wants them to take him to Mexico. Right? So as soon as this stuff is delivered, this guy lets the three dozen hostages go. Now let me just point out, again, the guy's wearing dark glasses, but many people on the plane see him. Right? If the guy had any distinctive marks on any part of his exposed face, neck, hands, the people around him would see him. So we know, we know that this guy's in his 40s. We know this guy's a smoker. On his demand note, when the plane lands in Seattle, right, it takes off, it lands. He asked for, among other things, negotiable American currency. What American would do that? Didn't he hijack the plane in America? If you're a plane hijacker, wouldn't you assume since you're making demands from American people, right? An American stewardess. You're landing in an American city. Wouldn't you assume that the money's going to be in dollars, not in pesos? I believe the fact that this guy asked for negotiable American currency implies to me the guy is not American. Right? This is a Canadian. Let's go one step further. The four parachutes. The guy has his choice of parachutes, but they're not all the same make and model. There's a more recent parachute among the four that apparently had better handling capabilities. That's not the parachute the guy picks. He picks the older, harder to handle parachute. Now the question is, why would he do that? Right? Is it because the guy is older himself? and wants a parachute that he feels comfortable with? Is it because the guy himself might be former military and wants to use gear that he's comfortable with? Right, if that's the case, he may have survived the jump. Right, from what I'm hearing, from what I've read, an experienced parachuter would have survived the jump, even though it's raining outside. Keep in mind, this guy, among his demands, asked that the plane fly at about 10,000 feet. Right? Someone who had at least a handful of jumps would have known what they're doing, might have grabbed the older parachute that they knew. What a dilettante. Someone who is making this up as they went along. Might have passed up on the better parachute because they might not have known what they were doing. It's my understanding because this guy jumped out the plane over a tree-lined area. Right? If he was a newbie at parachuting, he likely is no longer with us. The chances of him surviving would have been slim.
Keep in mind, years later, a young kid uncovers a little bit less than $6,000 of the money by a riverbed, right? Understand, the money still had the rubber bands around it that had been placed around it back in 1971. The money had decayed, looked like it had been out in the elements for a while. So some of these theories that Dan Cooper went back to the area, right? And the area where the money was found is about 20 miles away from where the police believed he jumped out of the plane. But let's say the money traveled downstream and banked itself by the riverbed. Right? It's very unlikely, given the decayed state of the money and the fact that the rubber bands are the same from 1971, that Dan Cooper went back to the area where he jumped out of the plane and then planted the slightly less than $6,000. Right? Let me just say, too, Dan Cooper takes off his tie. Right? The authorities should have Cooper's DNA. He takes off his tie and he leaves it on the plane. Now the tie he leaves on the plane has titanium on it. Right now, just the fact that the guy is in his 40s is wearing a tie that has titanium on it should eliminate 98% of the population, shouldn't it? Right, guys in their 20s, teenagers, they're eliminated. Guys in their 60s, they're eliminated. Right, they know the guy's approximate weight, so guys who weigh substantially more, they're eliminated. Right, they know his approximate height. He's there the day before Thanksgiving, right? You get the feeling he's working someplace that involves metal cutting, that would get titanium on his tie. The tie is probably something this guy wears for work. So it's astonishing that people haven't figured out who the guy is. Let's go one step further. Let's say the conditions, right, the rain, right, in the part of Washington over which this guy jumps out of the plane are just too much. And let's say the guy perishes, right, parachute hits a tree. There's only so much even a skilled parachuter can do. Why haven't we heard about some guy in his 40s who works in some plant that has titanium around, who might have a military past going missing. It's a little bit odd. No one has reported anyone who seems to fit D.B. Cooper's, let's be real here, Dan Cooper's description. No one has reported Uncle Johnny or whoever going missing right around Thanksgiving of 1971 who may have done this crime. Right? No one. Understand, I know there's a theory that some guy from Michigan left his family in October of 1971 and may have done this crime. I would say that's unlikely. The fact that this guy has titanium on his tie, right? The fact that this guy has picked the Thanksgiving holiday is literally copying the actions of a fictional character named Dan Cooper from a French comic book Right? The fact that he's picked a commuter flight. Understand, this guy, if he wanted to go to Mexico, could have tried to hijack a plane going to Mexico. 
right? This is airport security circa 1971, not now. Right? The guy apparently got by just writing his name, Dan Cooper, on the paperwork. Back then, you really didn't have to show much. No one has come forward saying they asked for or saw a fake ID from this guy. Right? No, no. This guy is going north, folks. Phoenix, excuse me, Portland to Seattle. I'm guessing the guy knew the terrain. If you're planning to jump out of a plane, you would want to make sure that there's an area that you can jump into. You wouldn't want the plane to be, let's say, flying over the Grand Canyon or New York City, thinking that you're going to successfully parachute out of the plane. So I believe this is a carefully planned crime by an older guy. All of these suspects are supposed to be in their 20s, in my opinion, cross them out. The people who believe that a woman did this, to me, are ignoring the fact that there are three dozen people on the plane who saw him, and he had the stewardess sitting next to him. Right? I believe this is a guy in his 40s who has thought this out wants people to believe he's on his way to Mexico and jumped out of the plane. I saw a show on Discovery and they had an interesting theory where they claim that the guy, while he's on the stairs of the plane, may have pretended that he had jumped, just shaken the stairway to leave the crew to believe that he had jumped out over Washington State. When in actuality, the guy's real goal, because he changes the destination to Reno, the guy's real goal was to jump in a more jumper-friendly place right before the plane lands in Reno. And of course, somebody wrote a Reno newspaper claiming to be D.B. Cooper, right? The problem I have with the letters is someone cut them out of newspapers, right? The lettering. So we don't really have enough. I'm short of the FBI releasing DNA information to believe that the letters were even written by the same guy who wrote Dan Cooper on his ticket at the Portland International Airport. Right. Let me um, let me just add to that Seattle, of course, is very close to Vancouver, Canada. Right. It's close to the Canadian border. The fact that this guy takes the name of a French comic book character, Dan Cooper, that very few Americans know of, implies to me that this guy is likely, in my opinion, based on the fact that he misspells, right, a word in the ransom note, that he miss, you know, he talks about negotiable American currency in another writing. I believe that this guy's first language is French. Right? They didn't do Dan Cooper comic books in English, folks. I believe this guy's first language is French. And I believe this guy was close to home across the border. Right? When he comes up with this plan to come to the United States and to hijack a plane from Portland to Seattle. Let me point out, too, that all of the notes sent to newspapers after this crime and the days following this crime refer to D.B. Cooper, not Dan Cooper. 
But there is a note. Where the writer says, hey, I've just enjoyed the Grey Cup in Vancouver, Canada. Right? Many Americans into football know about the Super Bowl. They don't know about the Grey Cup. They don't know about the Canadian Football League. This crime, to me, has a distinctly Canadian feature to it. Right? I don't believe that this plane jacker, a guy savvy enough to ask for four, right, parachutes, didn't want one faulty parachute or anything like that. A guy savvy enough to ask for food for the crew. A guy savvy enough to make sure the stewardess sits next to him. So if anyone makes a move toward him, he has a plane employee as a hostage that he could theoretically harm. I think this guy is very savvy. I believe this guy thought this crime through. Right? But didn't know. Right? Didn't know certain things. Hence the misspelling in the bomb note and the request for negotiable American currency. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you feel that there's someone else who did this crime, if you're one of those who believe that he actually stays on the stairway outside the plane all the way across multiple states and then jumps down in Reno. If you believe this guy is still alive, if you're convinced that this guy is someone else, right? Some, some other demographic, then I hope you leave that information in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.